This past week, my wife, Kelly, got a call from her father. They own a small ranch out in the middle of Kansas. And he told her a hilarious story that has tremendous poignance to what we're talking about today. He had gotten a new rooster and put it in what was their rooster barn or the rooster cage. And this rooster was a bully rooster. And so the next morning when he goes out to look at what's going on in the cage, a number of the roosters were up on the ceiling of the cage on the side, and they were all in terror. On the other end, there were these other roosters who all had their feathers over their heads because they were terrified of this one bully rooster. Well, my father-in-law, Ted, said, we can't put up with this. So he took that rooster, bound the rooster, tied its legs up, threw it in his Polaris, drove a mile away from their farm, and put the rooster out in the wild thinking the coyotes will get this rooster. <laughs> the next morning, he goes out to the cage, and the rooster's back home. <laughs> Folks, we have a bully. He's called Satan. He is a true dark power. He wants to bully you with fear and intimidation. He wants to bully you over your past. He wants to bully you over who you don't think you are because he's convinced you're, you're less than what God has made you to be. And he's a bully, and we can drive him out, we can bind him, we can command him to go, but just like Jesus after his time in the wilderness where he defeated the devil, at an opportune time it says that he came back because we're in a relentless fight. We're in a constant battle against the powers of darkness. And we're going to look at that again today. In our study of the book of Ephesians, we're in Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to begin in verse 10. I find too often in the church we're passive. Too often in the church people are so complacent. When in the Bible that is not the kind of faith the early church had. The early church had a violent faith. In fact, Jesus said this, the kingdom of heaven suffers violent, and the violent must take it by force. Now, that is not violence in a physical realm. That is a spiritual violence. That is being a passionate follower of Jesus Christ who stands against the powers of darkness. And that's what Paul's talking about. Let's begin once again in verse 10. Ephesians 6, 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. That's his strategies. The enemy has a strategy. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. So there is an army of... There is a legion of demonic forces who are at work trying to intimidate and bully us. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now, we talked about each of those armaments. This is symbolic language. This is metaphoric language. But he is comparing the weapons, the armament of a Roman soldier to the spiritual armament we have. And he has talked to us about the belt of truth, that our whole life has to be girded up with truth. He's talked to us about the breastplate of righteousness. We have to recognize that we are righteous in Christ and then live a righteous life. And we have talked about those things, and now we're coming, after having talked about our feet being shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, to verse 16 and the next piece of armor. Above all. Now, that word above all doesn't mean it's the most important. This isn't talking about priority. It's talking about that it covers all. It has the potential of covering every part of our body. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Our enemy, there is a real malignant force in this universe. There is a real demonic entity, and he's called wicked. That wicked means twisted, perverse, destructive, 
And he is after you. He's after your family. He's after our nation. He's after our church. He is our real enemy behind all of the forces we see arrayed around us in this world. And he says that we're to take up the armor. And this last piece of armor, this next piece of armor that we're looking at is the shield of faith. Now, the Romans had two shields. If you were a Roman soldier, you had one shield that was used for parades. It was used for display. It was a small round shield that you would hold up and you would march with and, and it would look so beautiful and it was very, very ornate. But then there was another shield. This is the shield Paul's talking about. It was a much bigger shield. Some historians say it was four and a half feet high and it was two and a half feet wide. In fact, the Greek word for it is the same as used for a door. That's how big it was. And if you positioned yourself correctly, it would cover all of you. That's why it says to take it all over you, to cover you. That's what the shield could do. And this shield was very interesting. It was made out of, first of all, two pieces of wood. They would put the wood together. And then they would put leather all around it. They would wrap it around, oftentimes with six layers of leather. And it was woven very tightly to where it was strong, almost like metal. And then they would actually take metal for a boss in the middle that they would hold on to. And then they would put metal as a frame around it. And that is what the shield was like. And it says, again, we're to take it above all or to cover all the rest. This piece is so vitally important. And it's here referred to as our faith. And our faith is vitally important. Paul says this in 1 Timothy chapter 1, beginning in verse 18. This charge I commit to you, son Timothy. Now, this is not his natural son. This is his spiritual son. And he says, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, having faith and a good conscience, which some having rejected concerning the faith have suffered shipwreck. Again, I want you to see we're in a battle. But what this battle is really about is our faith. The enemy may attack our physical body, he may attack our finances, he may attack our family, he attacks our mind, but what he's really after is our faith. That's why it's called the good fight of faith. He wants to destroy your faith. He wants you to doubt God's goodness. He wants you to doubt God's faithfulness. He wants you to disbelieve the promises of God. He wants your faith to become shipwrecked. He wants you to deconstruct your faith. The most important thing you have is your faith and the enemy's after your faith. He wants to destroy your faith. So how do we stand against him? We have to activate our faith. And that's what Paul is telling us in this passage. This shield would protect them, it says, from fiery darts. Darts were constantly being shot at them. So they would take this massive shield with their left hand and they would maneuver it around when they were in combat. And one of the things it did was protect them from arrows. In one particular battle I read about, an historian said that a Soldier had 220 darts in his shield. And folks, let me tell you, that's what it's like with the enemy. He's constantly firing those darts at us. Some of us wonder why marriage can be so hard. You've got an enemy trying to destroy it. Some of you wonder why parenting can be so hard. You have an enemy firing darts constantly to destroy it. But ultimately, what he's after is your faith. And Paul says, our faith is a shield. And that's my first observation. Your faith is a shield. It protects you from the darts of lies and accusation and temptation and discouragement. Over in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, Paul says, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Now, when he says sight, it's really talking about by our senses, not by what we see or feel or touch. None of those things can we depend on in this spiritual battle because that's only what we see. And we have to always remember there's an invisible realm. And frankly, that takes faith. 
Because most of us are totally, completely captured by the things we can see and feel and touch and hear. We're, we're completely captured by that. But Paul is saying there's another dimension. It's an invisible realm you can't see, but it's just as real, if not more real, than the physical realm. And it has a tremendous impact and effect on us all the time. And it takes faith to believe in the invisible realm because you can't see it. So you have to live by faith, not by sight. When I talk about demonic entities and Satan, understand that's all in the invisible realm. So to even believe that, it takes faith. You say, well, you look around and you see that there's some kind of malignant force. There's some kind of evil at work. Of course you do, but it's unseen. And so we begin to question, we begin to wonder. There's so much evidence of God in so many ways, particularly scientifically now. It's hard to imagine that there wasn't a God who created all things. But the reality is we can't see him. And so it takes faith to believe in God. It takes faith to live the Christian life. It's absolutely essential. And I want you to understand what faith is today. Let's look at Hebrews 11.1. 1. The writer of Hebrews says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now listen to that. Our faith is the substance of things hoped for. It fills in. It's the evidence of things not seen. We don't see the invisible realm. We don't see this other dimension. But our faith is the evidence that it really exists. Because listen what faith is. I want you to, I want you to write this one down. Faith is acting on what God has said. Faith is acting on what God has said. Faith without works is dead. It's not simply believing. It's acting on what you believe. And what you believe is what God said. So God says there's an invisible realm, so I believe it. God says there is a force of darkness that's at work against it, so I believe it. God tells us there are angels activated, so I believe it. God gives me promises in his word, so I believe them. That is faith. Faith is acting on what God has said. We see that in the life of so many people within the scripture. One of them was a man named Abraham. Paul talks about Abraham in Romans chapter 4. Beginning in verse 17, he says this. As it's written, I've made you the father of many nations. In the presence of him who we believe, God, who gives life to the dead. And listen to this. And calls those things which do not exist as though they did. So God met Abram in Ur of Chaldea, and he gave him a promise. His promise was that you're going to have children as the stars of the sky and the sand of the sea. And he said, through one of your descendants, all nations of the earth are going to be blessed. He also promised him a land. Abraham went out to that land, having never seen it, not even knowing where he was going. What is that? That's faith. God said he would give him a land. So he went out in the direction of where God told him to go. And he believed God that he was going to have children even though at the time he was 75 years old and his wife was 66 and had never had a child and never had been able to have a child. And yet he believed those things which he couldn't see. He called those things which be not as though they were. In fact, his name Abram means exalted father, but Abraham means the father of many nations. And from that day forward, he said, my name is Abraham. My name is Abraham. I'm the father of many nations. No, you're not. You don't have any children. I'm the father of many nations. He called those things which be not as though they were. That's faith. We go on and read in verse 19, and not being weak in faith, he didn't consider his own body already dead since he was about 100 years old. Now, this is talking to the very end before he has the child. And the deadness of Sarah's womb. He didn't waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. What is this saying? Abraham acted on what God had said. Now, it was a struggle. It was a battle. This was a 24-year challenge. And if you read 
the entire context of what happened, he did have faith challenges at times. How many's ever had a faith challenge? Abram had a faith challenge, but what God looked at was the end of his life where he was strong in faith and gave glory to God for what he could not see, but knew God had said. And that is faith. That is what faith actually is. Now, notice Abraham's faith was not in faith, but his faith was, it says, in God's faithfulness. That what he had promised, he was able to perform. So I really want you to hear this because some of you are intimidated because you feel like you lack faith, like your faith is small, like you have little bitty tiny faith. But Jesus said all it takes is faith like a mustard seed. If you've ever seen a mustard seed, you probably didn't see a mustard seed. It's so small, it's so hard to see. But here's the reality. It doesn't take a lot of faith. What it takes is a God who's very faithful. Has anybody here ever walked on a lake that was just covered in ice and you walked across it? There are some very brave people here. I think that would be very difficult. You'd have to know that that ice was faithful. Now, I got to tell you, somebody with great faith, but only two inches of ice may be in big trouble. Somebody with little bitty faith like me when it comes to ice is going to be fine as long as that ice is two feet deep. It's not your faith, it's God's faithfulness. And we have a faithful God. What he has said, it he will do. Mark chapter 11, verses 23 to 24, actually begins this way. So Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. I want you to see that. Have faith in God. God, not have faith in faith. Maybe you've read some of the books. Have faith in believing. Have faith in faith. And sometimes that is very helpful from a human perspective, from a motivational perspective, but that is not biblical faith. Biblical faith is not having faith in your faith. It's having faith in God's faithfulness. Have faith in God. For assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things which he said will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever you ask when you pray, believe you receive them and you will have them. I want you to notice a couple of things here. One thing very interesting to me is you speak to mountains and you pray for things. There's some things you don't pray for, you speak to. You don't pray that a demon leaves somebody, you command it to go. There are some things you speak to, there's other things you pray for. And what do you receive when you pray? You receive, you have what you believe you receive when you pray. That's it. What you have in prayer is what you believe you receive before you get it. So there is a difference between having and believing you receive. You can believe you received and not have yet. Why? Because you believe what God has said. If God has promised it, I believe it. That is faith. And it's so important that we understand the value and the significance of faith. The shield of a Roman soldier was linked to his belt. Do you remember the belt of truth? So they actually had a little clip that their big shield would go on. And I think that's important. There's a connection between the belt of truth and our faith. Because our faith is based on what? What God has said. And where has he said it? In his word. So listen to me. Romans Chapter 10, verse 17 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Why? Because the word of God tells us what God has said. You can't have faith in what God has said unless you know what God has said. So it's very important and absolutely essential to your faith that you be saturated in the word of God. 
Let me tell you one of the reasons that was so important in that day. Because remember, this is being compared to the Roman shield. In that day, a Roman soldier, before he went into battle, would take his shield and he would put it in a tub of water. And he would soak his shield for hours and hours and hours, sometimes all night before he went into battle. Why was that? The reason is because not only did they shoot arrows, they shot fiery arrows. Sometimes they would put some combustible uh, sort of material on the arrow and light it on fire and then shoot it. Other times, they would take a cane arrow and they would take some kind of fuel and put it inside and then they would shoot it and when it hit its target, it would explode. So they were fiery arrows. So they had to take their shield and make sure that if an arrow hit it, that it would go out because of the water that was in the shield. And folks, in the same way, we have to be saturated with the water of the word. So here's my second observation. Faith must be soaked in the water of the word. Ephesians 5.26, Paul's going to go on and say, and we have looked at this verse, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. We need to be saturated in the word of God. If you want to be a person of faith, you need to be saturated in the Word of God. That's why we have the Radiant Word Reading Program. We need to be in the Word every day. We need to read the Word, pray the Word, meditate the Word, memorize the Word, believe the Word, and live the Word of God. In order to have faith in what God has said and act on it, you have to know what God has said. And so it is critical that we understand the value of God's word when it comes to faith. But there are two Greek words for word of God. One is logos. That's what was used when it talked about the belt of truth. Later in this passage, it's going to talk about another Greek word, and it's the word rhema. What is the difference between the two? Well, Greek scholars have difference of opinion. But I think a good way to understand it is that the logos is the written word of God while the rhema is the spoken word of God. It's the word God speaks to your spirit. It's when you're reading the Bible and suddenly a passage comes alive. There are other times when God actually speaks to you and gives you a word and you know God has spoken to you. It may be through an inner impression. It may be through that gentle whisper that God gives. But in some way, God speaks to your spirit, speaks to your heart, and you just know it, and you step out on what God has said. Of course, the faith journey I've been on most recently is our North Campus. When we came to Colorado Springs, we weren't here long, that I realized that Radiant needed to be in the northeast part of the city. I had such a sense of that. And in fact, my wife and I lived in the northeast part of the city. So I would drive down Powers almost every day. And as I went down Powers, I noticed there was a part of town where there were no churches. There were no churches anywhere around. And I said, we need to be on North Powers. But the land was too expensive. And people told me, there's no way you're going to be able to get land up there. A church can't afford it up there. But we believe that's what God told us to do. So the Lehman Brothers crisis came, and there was a financial crisis in the nation. Uh, the value of land went way down, and we were able to purchase some property, not exactly where I thought we should be, but it was in the northeast part of town. And so we began to take steps of faith to fulfill what we believe God wanted us to do. And I want you to understand that. This is so practical, and it's so important. When God tells you to do something, don't be presumptuous unless God has told you certainly to do a certain thing. For instance, I knew God wanted us to do something in the northeast part of the city. I had a sense of that so strongly. So what did we do? We went ahead and bought some land that we were able to purchase at a price we could afford. And then we actually put a campus inside of a school. Because what? That was the logical, natural thing to do. Do you remember in Acts chapter 16, where Paul has this sense? You know, it's not a word from God in the way that he heard an audible voice or something strong. He just had a desire. God works in our desires. 
Proverbs said, God gives us the desires of our heart. I believe that part of what that means is God will put a desire in our heart that he wants us to fulfill. Some of you have desires. There's something you sense God wants you to do. You, you have a desire to serve God in a certain way, and you need to step out on that. Paul had a desire to go visit all the churches they'd seen before. So he started to go a certain way because it was the natural, logical way to go, and the Holy Spirit said no. So then he went the next logical way, and the Holy Spirit said no. So he had to stop, center down, wait on God, and he actually was given a vision to go to Macedonia. And he went. And that's how it is oftentimes in following God. Some of you have a dream God's put in your heart. What do you do with that? Well, don't just sit there. Begin to prepare for it. Maybe there's somebody here that you have a sense that God has called you to be a medical missionary. Well, you don't just sit around. You're going to have to have really good grades. You better study biology and some subjects that apply to that. You better be a straight-A student. Then you've got to go to medical school. Then you're going to have to raise funds to go to the mission field. You start taking the steps you know to do. You say, but what if it's not the right step? Notice what happened to Paul. God stopped him. There was just a sense, this isn't right. This isn't what I'm supposed to do. See, some of you need to get off your keister and you need to get out and begin to pursue the vision God has put in your heart. You need to start taking those steps. Because so often it's one day, one step at a time in following Jesus. And he'll stop you if it's not right. So we were at that property and things just worked out where that property wasn't a good property for us. And then God opened a door. Every day I would drive down Powers Boulevard, I would come to research in Powers, and I would think this is the perfect place for a church. So I would always look east, and I talked to the people who own the land over there, and they were asking an exorbitant amount of money, and they seemed like people that could have been hard to deal with in that situation. So I just kept praying. And then one day, the west side of research and Powers opened up, and we were able to purchase a piece of property there. So then we need to build a building. Well, what's the next step? We start designing plans for the building. Folks, there's a next step God has for you. It's a step of faith, but it's a step you can take. It's not presumption. It's just endeavoring to follow what God has called you to do. So we begin to, we begin to make the plans. We have the plans available, and then we need to raise money. We do a capital campaign. We save money every year. Our money is increasing, and we're thinking we're going to build, and then COVID hits. We also need to sell some land, the land that we'd originally purchased, and we don't have a buyer yet. So finally, there is a contract on our property. So we plan to step out and build. We get the bids back, and I almost pass out when I see the bids. <laughs> Inflation has begun to hit, and the prices are high. I'm told supply chains may improve, and prices may come down, and whoever told me that was wrong. So we continue to wait, and, and we wait, and our land goes ahead and sells, and we say, what are we going to do? Now prices are going up, and, and it, the interest rates are going up. What do we do? And one day I'm in prayer, and all of a sudden I hear that still small voice again, only this time it's a little louder because I think I need it a little louder. Some of us need a little louder. Can anybody relate to needing a little louder? I'm a very conservative person. I'm not, see, some of you think that you have to be very uh, into risk to have faith. No, you just have to trust God. You have to wait on the voice of God. And God said, it's time to rise and build. So I said, hallelujah, let's check into it. Interest rates were not at that time as high as I anticipated. Then we went and put it out to bid. And the price came back. And it was a half a million more than it was before. And I said, oh God, are you sure? Are you sure? So we prayed and we sought the Lord. And Kelly got a word from God. And listen to this word. It's so interesting. I think this is helpful to people. The word was this. Like the children of Israel, step out and I will part the Red Sea. But you first have to step out. Have you ever noticed that in the story? God didn't just part the Red Sea. The priests had to step out. As they stepped out, then God parted the Red Sea. See, some of you are waiting for God to part the Red Sea. He says, step out. And here's the other word he gave us. Look for the dry land. Look for the dry land. 
Some of you need that word today. That, that God is going to make a way where there may seem to be no way, but it may not be obvious you have to look for the dry land. And so we took that as a word from God, and we began to do the project. And all along the way, we have found dry land. Most recently, after having $750,000 in change orders, we said, God, what, what now? Where's the dry land? I, 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 I really don't see any dry land. I just see Red Sea everywhere. <laughs> and at that very time, we realized that our Woodland Park campus was ready to become an independent campus. They had been preparing for it. So the decision was made that the best thing for them and the best thing for us was to sell them the building that we had been able to acquire there at a very low price compared to what it's valued at. And all they could borrow was $600,000, which was exactly the amount we needed to be able to complete the project. What was that? Dry land. Folks, what am I saying in all this? Faith is acting on what God has said. If God has told you something to do, follow through and begin to look for dry land. Begin to take steps of faith, the steps you know you can take. And as you do, God's going to part the Red Sea for you. I could talk about so many things and so many situations in people's lives, but let's leave it at that for right now, and maybe we'll come back to that. When you have a word from God, it is so powerful. It is so helpful. You know why? Because God loves to be reminded that he's a faithful God. He loves to be reminded of his word. See, some of you struggle with your salvation. Am I really saved? You need to go back and say, God, you said. God, this is what you said. And, and you know, God doesn't need to hear that as much as you need to hear that. God, this is what you said. And I simply believe what you said. I have put my faith in Jesus Christ. And by grace I'm saved through faith, not of myself, but it's a gift of God, not of my works, least anyone should boast. That's what you said. And I, I can't tell you, during this whole process, how many times I've gone to God and said, God, you said rise up and build. I didn't say that. You said rise up and build. You said step out and the dry land will appear. You said it, God. So show me the dry land. Folks, God is faithful to his word. I think he loves being reminded of his promises. But you have to know what those promises are. And so many of them are simply in the word of God. Remind God, which is reminding yourself of what he said, and act on what God has said. And that, my friend, is faith. Here's my third observation. Faith must be anointed with fresh oil of the Spirit. Now remember, they soaked their shields in water, but you know what else they did? They would take their shields and they would have to maintain them because they were wrapped in leather. If you've ever had a leather couch or a leather chair, it's important that periodically you treat the leather or it'll become brittle, it'll even break up, it'll even tear. That's what would happen to their shields. So they would have to, on a regular basis, most of them every day, get some oil, take a cloth, and anoint their shield with oil. They had to put oil on it and rub the oil in. That's what the anointing means. We need a regular anointing of the Holy Spirit on our faith. And where do you find it? In the presence of God. So not only do we need to be in the Word every day, we need to be in the presence of God every day. The psalmist said this in Psalm 92.10, But my horn you have exalted like a wild ox. I have been anointed with fresh oil. Folks, I don't want stale oil. I don't want to live on my past experiences. I've had some amazing experiences in God, and many of you have too. But I can't live on my past experiences. I need fresh oil. 
I need the fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit every day. I not only need the word, I need the spirit. I need to be in the presence of God. Folks, if you want to be a person of faith, you need to be a person of the word, but you also need to be a person of the presence. We are people of the book and we are people of the presence. We spend time in the presence of God. We experience the anointing of God. We hear a word from God. That's who God has called us to be. My fourth observation is that faith will quench fiery darts. Look at Ephesians 6.16 again. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you may be able to, listen to this, quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. The enemy will constantly shoot fiery darts at us. And if he can hit our heart, if his fiery dart can hit us, it will ignite something in us. It ignites lust within us. It'll ignite sinful passions in us. Materialism, hedonism, discontent. Fiery thoughts that bring doubt and unbelief and fear and anxiety. Flaming arrows that lead to pride and bitterness. People themselves will shoot fiery darts at you. You know, God uses people. Let me, let me give you a little hint. The devil uses people. The enemy uses people that will be used by him. And some of them will attack you. Everyone in this room has been attacked by people's words at one time or another. That's why we read in Psalm 64, 3 and 4, that these people sharpen their tongue like a sword. They bend their bows, bows to shoot their arrows. Bitter words that they may shoot in secret at the blameless. Suddenly they shoot at him and they do not fear. People will shoot arrows at you. I'll tell you, every day I pray that no weapon formed against me would prosper. That every tongue that rises against me in judgment, I would condemn. But I've got to condemn them. Some of you, you have people who speak lies at you, accusations at you. You have to say, I'm going to condemn every one of those words. Not condemn the people, but condemn the words. I put those people in God's hands, but I say those words will have no effect on me. Because I know the truth. I know what God has said. I'm living by faith. I have my shield of faith. And that shield of faith will quench those fiery darts. Sometimes those darts are sickness and disease and tragedy and persecution. Let me tell you, you've got to take your shield of faith for when those fiery darts come. And you've got to remind yourself, because this is what faith is, you have to remind yourself of what God has said. And let me tell you, the main dart the enemy is going to hurl at you, the main dart, the main arrow he's going to shoot at you is to question the goodness of God. Because things happen in our life that are tragic, that are difficult, that are hard, that just simply don't make sense. And it causes you to question God's goodness. And that's what he's after. Because he's after your faith. So that you won't act on what God has said. So you have to quench those fiery darts. And you do it with your shield of faith. And I've got to tell you, it's critically important. Lustful thoughts will come at you. Lustful images possibly you'll see by no desire of your own. It just pops up on you. That happens. And you know what you have to do? You have to raise your shield of faith. And say, God is good. He wants my best. He's working for my good. And he said I should live in purity. He said I should set no wicked thing before my eyes. He knows what's good for me. He knows what's best for me. And that isn't best for me. Fiery dart's going to be shot at you of offense. You need to be bitter. You need to be resentful. You can't forgive them. You need to get revenge. You throw up that shield of faith and you say, no, my God's good. And he's working for my good. And God says, I need to forgive. I need to release that my best is to let them go. You have to remind yourself. You have to use your shield of faith against these fiery darts. Oh, I see that guy's car. How does he afford a car like that? I should have a car like that. I need a car like that. I can't believe he got a car. No, throw up that shield of faith. He said, I'm going to be content with what I have. And he will never leave me and forsake me. And that's far more important than a car. Even though, Lord, if you want to give me a car, that's good. <laughs> you got to throw up that shield of faith. You got to throw up that shield of faith. 
And I want to challenge all of us in that today. Now, here's something you have to understand. That what the enemy is after is your faith. And that's the most important thing. That's the most precious. It's the most valuable. So let me tell you how you stand in faith. Sometimes it's so difficult because of the situations and circumstances we face. I think of the three Hebrew children in, in the book of Daniel. Do you remember Nebuchadnezzar tells them to bow before some idol statue and they will not bow. And so Nebuchadnezzar is going to have them thrown into a furnace of fire. It, talk about a fiery dart. This is a fiery furnace. And they say, King, you throw us in that furnace and our God is going to deliver us. Then he, they say this, Nevertheless, even if he doesn't deliver us, we're not going to bow. That's the attitude we've got to have. The other day I was talking to one of our staff pastors and he's going through a challenge in his family with one of his uh, children's health. And he said, I'm believing God for total healing. I'm believing God to just dissolve that tumor. However, even if he doesn't, we're going to trust God and God's going to see us through. <laughs> Folks, it's about God's goodness. It's about God's faithfulness. It's about your faith. That's what the enemy's after. Don't let him shake your faith. Hebrews 11 is the faith chapter. It talks about all the great heroes of faith. I'm going to read a little bit of that to you real quickly. Hebrews 11, 33 to 35. It says, speaking to these great heroes of faith, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, and out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the alien, and their women received their dead to life again. Woo! I want to be part of that group, don't you? Now, those are people of faith, but he's not done. Beginning in verse 35, he says this, others were tortured. Don't know if I want to be part of that group. <laughs> not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trials of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were tempted, they were slain with the sword, they wandered about in sheepskin and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth, and all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promises. But they were great heroes of faith. Because faith isn't always getting what you are praying for or believing for. It's believing even when you don't see it. Because they were looking to something far greater. Our greatest faith is about eternity, not about this life. See, some of you are believing for healing. And I believe God's will is divine healing. I never question it. Somebody comes to me and they want prayer for healing. I never question the will of God. I mean, it's absolutely concrete in the Bible. However, the Bible says the secret things belong to the Lord. There's some things we don't understand. But you know what I do know? The scripture says that he took my infirmities and bore my sicknesses on the cross. Jesus suffered in his physical body for me so that I can receive divine healing. But that is an eternal promise. Someday when Jesus returns, I'm going to be caught up to be with him. And this mortal body is going to put on immortality. This corruptible body is going to be putting on incorruption. And that body's not going to have any more sickness, any more disease. And it's going to have a full head of hair. That's what I believe. I believe that. That is my ultimate hope. So if I don't receive a healing now, I'm, I would love to. But if I don't see it now, I'm going to see it someday. That's my faith. Folks, do you get that? Here, here, let me give you another one. Book of Revelation. This is, this is so mind-blowing. The Antichrist, the beast, he is killing believers. He is killing those tribulation saints. And every time he kills one, they're martyred, and he says, we won. The beast in his kingdom says, we won, we won, we won. Those martyrs die. They go to heaven, and they say, we won. Who won? They won. Because you could kill me if you want, but it's not going to shake my faith. I'm standing in the presence of God. <laughs> Folks, that's what it's about. That's being people of faith. Finally, here's my final observation. Join your faith with others. 
Now, let me tell you about these shields. And of course, this isn't what they look like, but I think this can be helpful. They would have these shields, and they would come together with their shields, and their shields would interlock. So maybe you've seen movies like Gladiator, and, and they portray it well, where you have all of these military people. If you have a weak stomach, don't watch Gladiator. But <laughs> they depict war in the Roman times. And so they have all of their shields together. And they're marching with them all together. So you see this massive line of shields coming towards you. Not only that, those in back put their shields over their head. What does that do? It protects them from any arrows or any attacks that come from above. They were like an armored tank coming at the enemy. Can you imagine that? You see rows of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of soldiers. Boom, 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 boom. They're coming with their shields. And they're coming overhead. That was a formidable foe. Folks, when we join our faith together, we're a formidable foe. We read in Matthew chapter 18 that if any two of you on earth agree is touching anything, it shall be done by my Father which is in heaven. Deuteronomy talks about Israel when they would rebelled against God and that one of their enemy would put them to flight, but two would put 10,000 to flight. In the same way, I think the inverse is true. When the body of Christ joins our faith together and we stand against the darkness, there is no foe that can overwhelm us. We are a formidable foe. I believe the enemy, the demons, they shriek, they cry out in absolute fear when the army of God standing as one stands against the powers of darkness. And folks, that's what we need in this hour. And that's what we're gonna see. October 12th, on Passover, many from the body of Christ, they're praying for a million women to be on the mall. It's Esther's and Mordecai's. We're going to join our faith together. And I believe as we do, there can be a shift in the spirit. Let me mention one other thing about these shields. They were red. Why were they red? Well, first of all, because of their god of war named Mars. His color was red. Why was his color red? Because of the blood of his enemies. Let me tell you, the blood of Jesus who died for his enemies is the blood that we uphold. It's the blood that's on our shield. It's the red that's on our shield. And by the blood of the Jesus. Oh, in fact, let me read to you from the book of Revelation. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. Folks, we have a faith that cannot be stopped that has been cleansed by the blood of Jesus and is operating according to the word of God and in the name of Jesus, no foe can stand against us. Let's pray together today. Father, I pray for every one of us. I pray for those today who came into this place feeling weak in faith, feeling overwhelmed by the enemy. But today, Lord, I pray they'd be strengthened in their faith. They would recognize today that greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. That we have a God who is faithful to his word. And right now, some of you need to make a decision right now. Right now, right now. Online, some of you are watching. You need to make this decision God has shown you something. He's given you a promise. He's told you something. And faith is acting on what God has said. Father, I pray for those who have not stepped out in faith. They've been timid. They've been reluctant. But may they trust you, Lord. May they know they're not dealing with two inches of ice. They're dealing with a massive, massive, massive foundation of absolute assurance on what God has said. And that we can step out in faith knowing the God who made the promise is able to keep the promise. And so, Father, we thank you for that today. And we say it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.